Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first in a series of webinars focused on finance, business resilience and growth. My name is Charles Davey and I'm a corporate partner here at Bishop Fleming and I have the pleasure of being your chair this morning. We have a really exciting speaker lined up this morning dealing with business resilience and finance. In a moment, Jack Callow will give an overview of the market. Lou Venner will then discuss effective ways to manage customers and debtors. Hazel Tucker will be discussing finance and the importance of good financial management. And finally, Malcolm Rhodes will explain the options available to businesses once all other options have been exhausted. Before I hand over to Jack, I do need to cover a few areas of housekeeping. I think if we've got our timing right, the talk should last for about 30, 35 minutes. So we've allowed plenty of time for questions at the end. And for those of you who haven't attended one of our webinars before, somewhere on the screen, you should find a Q&A button and you can post your questions in the Q&A slot. If, if you want to be anonymous, kick, kick the tick the box or it would be great if we can give you a sort of uh, a name check when we are asking those questions. Uh, plan is to ask those questions at the end when all the speakers are finished. So, so just keep populating as we go through. There's, there's well over 100 people on this morning, so hopefully we will get lots of questions. Uh, if we don't get through them all, because we'll keep this to the hour, uh, we will follow up uh, afterwards and I'll talk a bit about that at the end. So. I'll be back after the talks to host the Q&A. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Jack. Thank you, Charles. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. So a bit of good news to kick off. My New Year's resolution is to be positive, lively and upbeat in all things that I do. So welcome to our webinar on the importance of business resilience. I did actually agree to go veggie for the month as well, but unfortunately that slipped my mind when I ordered cotton chips on a weekend, but that's not really relevant. Resilience, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. Shoot me down if you will, but I think it's fair to describe the past 10 months as difficult at the very least. So what has been and what is the capacity of your business and the businesses of your clients to recover? Well, in terms of adapting, the answer may well be very positive. We know some businesses have found ways to secure at least some revenue. We also know that some businesses have grown and achieved success, but the majority, the, major the, the opportunity to recover simply hasn't even started yet. And all businesses continue to face the uncertainty of what happens next. So what can be done to maintain and improve business resilience to explore Let's go back to the start. Bishop Fleming is a firm of chartered accountants and we offer a full range of services, including, of course, the classics, audit, tax and accountancy services. And they are all a real hit, not just because we do an exceptional job, of course, but because by law you must prepare accounts, you have to pay your tax and in certain criteria you have to have an audit. When the first lockdown hit, and in the small time frame before government support measures were really ramped up, there was a large amount of contingency planning and our colleagues put us as in the restructuring team to good use by bringing us into those conversations. Now, the challenges of that time aside, we enjoy talking to our clients and we enjoy talking to intermediaries about the extreme and immediate changes that had just hit our business landscapes. But these conversations emphasised a pre-existing challenge that it shouldn't take a global pandemic for these conversations to happen. And of course, there is no legal requirement to have them. So why bother? When I joined the industry almost 10 years ago, there was an analogy going around, and it probably still is, of a business MOT. Now, I should point out that it is never my intention to offend, should you align with such an analogy. But whilst I appreciate what is being aimed at here, it is not one that I use personally. And that is for the very simple reason that I don't know anyone who enjoys getting an MOT. In fact, people actively replace their cars on a three year cycle to avoid them. Talking to us about maximizing your business resilience should be, well, in fact, it is a very enjoyable experience. Now time, a common theme in the restructuring world is the importance of time. The earlier issues are flagged, the more options available the more that can be done, and I have no argument with that one at all. In fact, I endorse it. But given the maximum amount of time, 
what is it that we can do? What difference can we actually make? Well, we advise on difficult and challenging situations, circumstances which are emotionally charged and stressful. We deal with the need for honest assessment, challenge assumptions, all of which often lead to tough decision. So it is worth stating the obvious. Collectively, we're looking to reduce the risk of businesses finding themselves in difficult and challenging situations. Tough decisions will always be a factor in business, but we're looking to reduce the risk of such decisions being forced upon businesses. Now, it is not easy to give notice of something you don't know is going to happen. And often when that thing does happen, the maximum time is given. It's just simply no time at all. So a far more productive solution to gaining time is to build relationships. If we talk regularly, like we did in the first two weeks of the pandemic, you will come to know the finer details of what we can do and we'll come to know far more about you and your business or your clients' businesses. This relationship will significantly increase the chances of warning signs being spotted. But not only that, business resilience being sustained at a high level. So what makes up the agenda of regular talks? Well, it's at this point I like to bring in a concept I call gaining a solvency advantage. Solvency advantage is achieved through the balance sheet. Take a very basic balance sheet, stock, debtors, cash and creditors, also known as your working capital. Obtaining solvency advantage is simply taking steps to move from one position to a more favourable one. It doesn't have to be a negative position to start with, but the balance sheet becomes stronger as a result. Now, Luke's going to talk about debtor conversion, dealing with potential problems in your customer base or supply chain. Hazel is going to talk on access to finance and Malcolm will touch on creditors. But we also, when talking about balance sheets, must give thought to reserves, which pulls in profit or in some cases a lack of. We assess, analyse and challenge financial performance. We challenge the assumptions made around it. And those conversations can happen with any business at any time. It doesn't have to be failing and it certainly doesn't have to be past the point of no return. It's worth reinforcing the point that these services are appropriate, notwithstanding what is currently going on in our worlds. And it is also worth reinforcing the point that we are all impacted by the unknown. The businesses that have adapted, the businesses that have experienced success are all facing the same uncertainty in how this might end. And in that lies the importance of business resilience for everyone. Before I hand over to Luke, I want to try and summarise how I see the current situation with an analogy of my own. Please forgive me. Take Formula One and a scenario where the safety car is out and all the cars are tucked in behind, waiting to be told we're racing again. Government measures will eventually cease, just as the safety car will always come in. And when that time comes, the question is, how well prepared will your business be? How well prepared will your clients' businesses be to not only withstand that change, but ultimately to succeed in it? Whatever the answer to that question is, tell us because we are interested, we have value to add, and because every relationship starts with a conversation. I'll now hand over to Luke, who will no doubt share more on the detail. Thank you. Morning, um, everyone. Thank you, Jack, and um, interesting safety car analogy there. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about effective working capital management today um, with a particular focus on your customers. So the importance of strict credit control and making sure that you're, um, you're, you're sort of trading with the right people and the right businesses will, will, will sound quite obvious to the majority of you. Um, some of you might not need to be worried about the credit worthiness of your customers, um, but as we move into a period when cash is going to be tighter than ever for a number of businesses, um, and, and sadly failures are, they're inevitable, um, it's important to highlight this. So to give this some sort of good added context, the following statistics really are worth a mention. So UK SMEs um, have lost more than £40 billion per year in unresolved disputes. Uh, we've got £131 billion tied up in late payments. We've got £4 billion spent a year on resolving disputes. We've got 70% of businesses um, who will have at least one big dispute within every three year period. And then only 11% of businesses will turn to a lawyer. And in our world, when we're, we're sort of dealing with businesses that are struggling, 
um, or have gone bust, bad debts, commercial disputes and the collapse of income streams because key customers have gone bust are unfortunately often the reason why businesses turn to us. So this really does uh, demonstrate the importance of sort of trading with the right customers, um, regularly reviewing customers' credit profiles, uh, and we, we do have access to credit reports that can help here if necessary, uh, ensuring that income streams aren't too concentrated, that your that your trading terms are appropriate, particularly if you supply goods and um, may need to reply on rely on rather on retention of title, for example, um, and that your credit control systems are adequate. So where does uh, where, where does Bishop Fleming's restructuring team fit into this? So there are two important areas that we can help with, which I'll explain now. The, the, the first is helping you recover bad debts and resolve commercial disputes. Now, I, I previously mentioned some eye watering statistics about the value of debts written off every year uh, and, and, and the value of commercial disputes, which end up being run resolved. And this costs businesses billions of pounds um, and the impact it has on cash flow is, is obvious and it's, it's often severe. I also mentioned that only 11% of businesses turn to the lawyer for help. So what, what, why do we think this might be? Well, the traditional uh, litigation method, it, it brings with it a number of problems. Firstly, interests are misaligned. Uh, not all the parties necessarily are sort of going in the, in the same direction. Uh, the claimant carries all the risk on adverse costs. So if you go to trial and you lose, um, you're on the hook for the other side's costs. Uh, costs are often disproportionate. So Whilst you might go to trial and you, you, you might win, it's going to cost you a, a shed load of money to actually get there. And consequently, the professionals are often the winners. Um, and then we've got the point around the, the sort of key stakeholders acting independently. So um, it, it's not always the case that all the parties uh, are sort of pulling in the right direction. And with that in mind, uh, and, and, with, uh, and in an effort to sort of help businesses recover bad debts and resolve commercial disputes, Escalate was created by three long-standing professional services firms uh, with whom Bishop Fleming is a now uh, a licensed partner. And the purpose of this was to create a solution whereby, firstly, you'll get a free legal opinion. Um, so we'll, we'll look at the papers with the lawyers, we'll, we'll look at the case and we'll let you know if we think it's got merit. Uh, if, if Escalate are content to engage, the case will be taken forward. You, um, as, as the client, you carry absolutely no risk whatsoever uh, because Escalate ensure against adverse costs. Uh, the costs are fully funded by Escalate, so court fees, for example, barristers fees, expert fees, uh, all funded by Escalate throughout the process. If, if you're going down the sort of traditional method, then you'd need to fund these as you go, which is a further, uh, further pressure on your cash flow. Um, the recovery of all these various costs is fully contingent upon success. And the success actually extends to recovering cash, not just um, securing a bit of paper. Uh, you've got visibility over recovery because Escalate will guarantee that 70% of damages will be remitted back to you. Um, and also, all the parties are operating under the same roof, which means the interests are aligned. So the lawyers, the funders, uh, us if necessary, and the insurer, we're all working together uh, towards one common goal. So you can see why this is quite appealing. Uh, you've got a, a fully funded case, costs are capped, um, and it carries absolutely no risk whatsoever, such that if we take the case all the way to trial and we lose the claimant, you, you have absolutely no cost exposure at all. So you're probably wondering what type of cases Escalate will consider. Well, it's it's basically anything from the, um, the straightforward uh, bad debts from £1,000 upwards to the multi-million pound uh, sort of complex legal disputes that, that might see themselves at the High Court. Uh, to date, uh, Escalate has already helped businesses unlock more than £100 million pounds in cash. So the reason for, um, for Bishop Fleming's partnership with Escalate is, is kind of twofold. We know, first of all, we know that um, our clients have bad debts. We, we see when we prepare statutory accounts, we see management accounts. We know that it's a common problem for businesses um, and, and it's obvious by the statistics that I quoted earlier on. And, and particularly in restructuring, we see firsthand the devastating impact bad debts uh, and the loss of key customers can have on businesses. So we wanted to offer a solution to our clients, which we, we, we hope can really help uh, you um, and other businesses resolve these problems and strengthen your own financial positions. And secondly, uh, as an Escalate licensed partner firm, uh, in, in certain situations, we can also help with the recovery process. The premise being that we're well versed to sort of commercial discussions in our everyday restructuring work. 
Uh, from a legal point of view, the solution works in a similar firm, a similar way rather. There are various law firms throughout the country who are uh, sort of accredited and licensed Escalate uh, partner firms like we are. And this ensures that the right firm, depending on geography and expertise, will be assigned to your case. And we've seen firsthand the amazing work that Escalate can do. Uh, so if you've exhausted your, your sort of internal credit control procedures and you do need help recovering a bad debt, or, or you've got a more complicated dispute on which you require advice, please do contact me or another member of the restructuring team um, for help. And what I should also say is that Escalate will go back three years. So if you've, got, if you've sort of written off cases in the past, um, there is definitely an opportunity to resurrect them. Now, of course, uh, the, the Escalate solution is designed to tackle those cases um, virtually, firstly, which have merit, uh, and secondly, uh, where there are good sort of recovery prospects, because after all, there's no point in Escalate uh, spending a lot of time and a lot of money on a case if if the other side isn't good for a judgment. So, so what do you do if if your customers simply can't pay rather than won't pay? Um, and this is where restructuring at Bishop Fleming can also help. So if your customers cite and they have a financial problem, uh, or or perhaps you know yourself that they struggle to pay you if you initiated proceedings, for example, we can most certainly help. We are regularly introduced to businesses uh, by, by other businesses, by banks, for example, to advise them on their options um, and then help them to implement them in an effort to keep them in business and also maximise the returns of the businesses that they owe money to you. To you. So if a customer of yours owes you a lot of money uh, or they're a, they're a significant customer of yours and it's a case of can't pay rather than won't pay, your best chance of recovering funds and securing future business is if they survive and not go bust. Restructuring and rescuing businesses is what we do on a day to day basis. So please, please do talk to us. And then finally, uh, there will unfortunately be those situations where your customers have gone bust uh, and they have entered an insolvency procedure and the, the prospects of recovery will then depend on the size of the estate, but also the effectiveness of the insolvency practitioner. Uh, and, and, and the purpose of the insolvency practitioner in a nutshell is to recover as much value as possible for the benefit of creditors, for the benefit of you um, as the business who is owed money, and also properly investigate the director's conduct for the purpose of potentially bringing action against them. So we've got a team of uh, licensed insolvency practitioners, including myself. So a piece of insolvency paperwork does land on your desk. Please don't ignore it, but instead pick the phone up and have a chat with us. We're always really happy uh, to talk about anything, and we'll do that, of course, on a no charge basis. Not only can we help to guide you if you're unsure, um, it, it might simply be a, a, a question around paperwork. It, it, it might be more of an in-depth review into the business itself. We may also be able to take the insolvency appointment in order to best protect your interest in the matter. So as insolvency practitioners, not only do we regularly return funds to creditors, uh, with our Escalate partnership, we can help to ensure that directors are held to account when it's appropriate. That's um, that's me done. I hope that um, that helps to explain the what was hopefully the valuable input we can provide um, when you've got issues with your customers, with your clients. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Hazel, who's going to talk about funding and the importance of cash flow management. Thank you very much. Over to you, Hazel. Thanks, Luke. And morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to be talking about why it's crucial for businesses to have visibility of their financial performance and to regularly monitor and forecast their cash flows. I will also be sharing some practical planning tips of funding options during these turbulent times. As we begin 2021, many businesses will be reflecting on their challenges encountered last year and will be planning for the year ahead. No doubt 2021 will continue to throw curveballs to every sector as well as present opportunities for growth. You might be continuing to navigate the business through unpredictable COVID lockdown restrictions, looking to get a new idea off the ground, developing new products, seeking to expand into new markets or trading internationally, needing to invest in capital expenditure or planning to acquire new businesses. Whatever your immediate priorities and future goals are, it will be essential to have a business plan with robust financial and cash flow forecasts to ensure that there is sufficient cash available to support the business at the right time 
and to identify any funding gap that needs to be managed. The Office of Nas National Statistics published the results of their fortnightly business impact of COVID survey last week. And one of their questions on business resilience asked trading businesses that were not closed at the time how long they thought their cash reserves would last. And the results across all sectors were rather alarming. 17% had no idea. 32% had less than three months cash reserves. And that also includes businesses which simply doesn't have any cash reserves. 16% had between four and six months cash reserves and the remaining 35% had more than six months cash reserves. For any business to avoid running out of cash and to prepare for any financial shocks, it is essential to review and monitor the existing working capital cash flow cycles for all income streams and expense commitments and forecast how it might look in the future. This will highlight any shortfalls in cash that will need to be bridged. Many established, viable and even profitable businesses fail due to not having cash available when they need it most and poor cash flow management. We can help you to identify whether there are any improvements that you can be made to your cash flow cycles and determine whether there is a shortfall funding need. Some examples of how we have helped our clients improve their cash flow include credit control management, which Luke has already covered earlier, tightening up invoicing procedures, changing customer credit terms and moving to direct debit payment collection, negotiating flexible payment terms with key suppliers, helping you to arrange time to pay ar arrangements with HMRC for overdue tax liabilities, providing proactive tax planning advice to access tax reliefs such as R&D tax credits or capital allowance claims, and advising on suitable grants available that you might be eligible for. Whilst the Government Intervention Support Grants, the Furlough Scheme and the Business Rates Relief have provided businesses with much needed support, we predict that there will be additional cash flow disruption when access to this support stops in the spring. The COVID government-backed loan schemes have performed a fundamental role in keeping many SMEs alive and have acted as an important triage system to identify and support qualifying businesses needing credit. The British Business Bank announced yesterday that South West businesses have received over 4.8 billion in funding from the largest two schemes. These loans will now be hitting their one year anniversary dates in March and the 12 month interest period will start coming to an end. So businesses need to be prepared and get ready to meet their future repayment obligations. There is still a finite time to access or restructure these facilities and I will discuss shortly the specifics on how these schemes might be an effective funding solution if you are seeking to raise finance. Many businesses took advantage of the VAT defer referral scheme for their June quarter last year, and the liability needs to be settled before the end of March. HMRC have announced that there will be an option to opt into a deferred payment scheme before the due date. I have checked online this morning though, and the application process doesn't appear to have gone live yet, but we are expecting it soon, so do look out for it. You'll be able to settle the deferred VAT over up to 11 months interest free instalments and there will be a need for it to be fully replayed by the end of March next year, that's 2022. If any of you have any concerns regarding any outstanding tax liabilities, whether that's corporation tax, income tax, pay as you earn or VAT, please speak to your Bishop Fleming advisor to your, discuss your options and the options available. I would also recommend that you have a planning review with your relationship advisor, certainly before the end of this tax year. It may be appropriate to advance the usual timing of the completion of your accounts and tax affairs for various reasons, and that might include 
to improve your credit ratings if your business has had a successful year of trading or to accelerate the attractive tax reliefs that might be available, such as research and development tax credits if you are undertaking qualifying activities. Having latest financials will certainly be necessary if you're seeking to raise external finance. If the business is in a situation where it has generated taxable losses, it may be possible to obtain a tax refund against previous tax paid. Now the Chancellor's budget is being held on the 3rd of March and tax rises are all but inevitable. It is a, just a question of when. So we need to assist you to help you to plan for these hikes. If only we had a crystal ball. I mentioned earlier the coronavirus business interruption government loan schemes, which were designed to support businesses in the UK seeing their cash flow disrupted um, last year as a result of COVID and this will be ending at the end of March. Well, we think so. This date has been changed and extended a few times now, so who knows if the date will change again. But if you are seeking to raise external finance or looking to restructure your existing facilities, now is certainly the time that action needs to be taken. We can advise you on the funding landscape and assist you with raising finance. Let's now recap on the two main schemes. The Bounce Back Loan Scheme, otherwise known as BBLS, has been offered to 116 Southwest businesses for ease of access during the turbulent and uncertain trading times. Finance is available for up to £50,000 or 25% of turnover, whichever is the lower, with an attractive interest rate of 2.5% and flexible repayment terms of up to 10 years after 12 months, with no early repayment settlement fees. Whilst we have experienced that many of our clients have deposited these funds for working capital cash flow back up, we are now advising them on whether their facility is actually sufficient for their needs and are considering if a CBILS facility um, would be more appropriate funding solution as they will be able to repay their bounce back loan from the CBILS funding obtained. It is possible for businesses that originally took out a bounce back loan to apply for a top up if they borrowed less than the maximum amount that they had available to them. The Corona Virus Business Interruption Loan Scheme, otherwise known as CBILS, is available for SMEs with a turnover of less than £45 million, looking to raise up to £5 million in finance. So far, over 6,400 loans have been offered to Southwest businesses. There are over 100 accredited lenders, including High Street Banks and Challenger Fintech Banks that we have access to through our partnership with Fintech Platform Capitalize. Now a lender can provide up to £5 million in the form of refinancing existing debt, term loans, overdrafts, invoice finance and even asset finance. The other benefits are that no capital or interest repayments for the first 12 months and there are no early repayment settlements charges with terms of up to six years. The maximum borrowing facility for CBILS is 25% of turnover or two times annual wage bill. There are no personal guarantees required for up to £250,000 However, multiple loans can be taken across different lenders with no guarantees of, on, on any of them. There are also the attractive interest rates that have historically been available with rates of that that have been capped by the British Business Bank so that they do not exceed 14.99%. Now to qualify for this funding, the business needs to have a borrowing proposal which the lender would consider viable if it were not for the pandemic and not have been classed as a business in difficulty on the 31st of March 2019. We are advising a significant amount of businesses at the moment on CBILS applications in a variety of situations to take advantage of the scheme, certainly whilst it still exists, including 
reviewing all of the existing finance arrangement facilities that businesses have in place and identifying whether CBILs would be beneficial due to cheaper cost of finance and no repayments for the first 12 months and potentially no personal guarantees. Businesses that have already drawn a CBILs facility but have identified that they need to raise more finance, whether that's to settle deferred liabilities such as rent payment holidays, suppliers, tax, or a need for a working capital buffer for future uncertainties. There are situations where businesses have been previously de declined by their existing bank for a CBILS facility, and they may be able to access um, funding from an alternative approved lender using different underwriting procedures. Businesses that are needing to raise working capital finance to accelerate their future growth plans um, to make use of the uh, preferential uh, terms available. Through our network of high street banking relationships and access to alternative lending market, my restructuring team have the expertise to advise in the more complex lending spectrum and can also help you to be investment ready for private equity investment. Can I just remind you that if you have any questions, please feel, uh, feel free to add them and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them later. Uh, but for now, I'm going to um, hand you now over to Malcolm, who's going to talk about director's responsibilities. Morning, Joel. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Hazel. Uh, very comprehensive review of um, available funding options uh, for companies at this particular time. Um, We've now heard about a few ways businesses can help improve their financial stability to be able to better survive these very difficult times. Um, but what if, despite doing all they can, corporate business owners find that their company is facing insolvency? What are then the other options available to them? How can we, as restructuring professionals, help? It's first important to recognise that where there is an insolvent position, directors have a responsibility to creditors alone and not to any other stakeholders. An urgent action is therefore often required to ensure that the creditor's position doesn't worsen. In most formal corporate insolvency processes, the director's conduct will be subject to later review, as Luke uh, pointed out earlier, and they could face sanctions or prosecution if they are found to have not hacked it as they should. So it's vital that they seek advice at the earliest opportunity. But with regard to options themselves, we're very often presented with a situation where the business owner has for some time been firefighting, maybe robbing Peter to pay Paul whilst trying to fill numerous creditor demands. Invariably, this can lead to a breakdown in creditor relations as promises are broken or payment deadlines missed. As a result, creditors may have lost faith and be moving forward with their own individual recovery actions. The first tool at our disposal, therefore, as qualified and experienced restructuring professionals is negotiation on the part of the business owner, simply bringing credibility back into the equation and providing creditors with a third party view. This works well, for instance, with the likes of HM Revenue and Customs in negotiating time to pay agreements, but equally trade and finance creditors will often see our involvement both as a demonstration of intent on the part of the business owners to properly address the situation and as an overview, uh, as an avenue to reach an optimum commercial outcome. Keeping matters informal will allow for appropriate individual arrangements with problem creditors to be entered into, but by their, by their very nature provide little security and will generally not be binding. In these circumstances, the business will remain open to adverse action. Ultimately though, it remains for whatever informal sol solution is found to be successfully implemented and failure to do so will leave the business owner having to consider formal processes. From a restructuring perspective, perhaps the process that might next be considered is a company voluntary arrangement or CVA, which is a legally binding contract between a company and its unsecured creditors to deal with the debt burden. Often by payments from income over a period of years where the business is viable, but also it can be linked to a structured asset disposal or even the sale of the business. CVAs have hit the headlines in recent years with their use in a number of high profile, high street retail insolvencies. Uh, to restructure landlord claims, but they remain a rarely used process. Of 17,000 or so corporate insolvencies in 2019, 
there were only 351 CDAs. Um, and we don't know from the statistics how many of those were successful. Um, the difficulties encountered are creditor buy-in, business viability, and generally, until a CVA is agreed in place, there's a lack of protection from adverse creditor action. Control of the business of the CVA remains with the directors, but the CVA, CVA itself is required to be supervised by an insolvency practitioner. Their role is to ensure that the terms of the arrangement are adhered to, and that appropriate action, such as possibly moving the company to liquidation, is taken in the event of default. However, CVAs can and do work in the right circumstances when properly constructed and implemented and are one of the options to be considered. In other circumstances, a far more robust process, however, is administration, which is a widely used restructuring tool. Administration allows for a greater deal of protection from all creditors, whilst, for instance, a sale of an otherwise viable business can be properly achieved. In appropriate circumstances, the rescue of the company as a whole may be possible. To avoid the negative PR impact of administration, very often a business sale may be conducted through the pre-pack administration process, whereby a sale is arranged and packaged in the lead up to administration for sign off by the administrators immediately they are appointed. This also works to ensure as far as possible that there is minimal interruption to the business itself, which simply on the day of administration passes from one owner to another. There are regulatory safeguards in place to ensure that any pre-packed transaction is properly reasoned and evidence to be the best outcome for all stakeholders. This includes a requirement for the advertiser in the business for a short period during the build-up to administration and other additional regulation where the sale is to the existing directors of the company. As an extra tool, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 introduced a new moratorium procedure to give companies breathing space to take advice, consider their options, and to put forward an appropriate rescue plan, including a new restructuring plan process also brought in by the Act. There's insufficient time today to comment on that new process to any great degree, other than to say it requires confidence in the rescue of the company as a going concern and will therefore only be appropriate in limited circumstances. Indeed, since it, its inception, there seems to have been very little take up, although it was utilised to great effect in the restructuring and rescuing of the Virgin Group late last year. Finally, in circumstances where administration may not be considered appropriate, a similar pre-packaged business sale can be considered as part of an overall liquidation strategy. Whilst this will not lead to the rescue of the company, it can ensure that a viable business survives. Such sales are quite rightly subject to specific scrutiny by the subsequently appointed liquidator, but proper and robust restructuring advice in the lead up to the transaction will help to validate its, its integrity. In all cases, early consideration of a particular situation is paramount, and the more time there is, the more options will be available. The Bishop Fleming restructuring team are here and happy to talk at any time. Thank you. I'll now hand you back to Charles. Uh, thank you to all our speakers. Um, we've got about 15, 20 minutes uh, to run through some questions. So I'm going to kick off um, with the questions. We've got, uh, just a reminder, if you do want to post a question, uh, just use the Q&A box on the uh, side of the Teams uh, screen and that will then pop up and then I can ask it. So so my first, I've got a couple of questions here. The first one probably to you, Jack. Um, what is the cost of a conversation with you? On mute, Jack. Every time. Apologies. Um, a very fair question. Um, I spoke for five or six minutes on not only the importance of conversations, um, but but hopefully it came across to how open we are to, to have those conversations. Uh, and I can I can give two answers uh, to, to this question. It, it would it would be foolish really for us to to slap a price on a conversation uh, when we are so open to having them. Uh, there's an intangible answer in the sense that our focus and our goal and our objective is to, is to get value out the door. Um, I can come up with a with a very poor uh, story of, of, of to demonstrate that. Um, I actually had tickets to the England Iceland game in the 2016 uh, Euro European Championships, as, as I'm sure for those of you that remember that game, I was bitterly disappointed with the extortionate price that I paid. Um, however, I would have paid 
10 times that to go to Istanbul to watch Liverpool beat AC Milan. So it very much comes down to what value we can add to the scenario, which will then tie into the cost ultimately of that conversation. But the first conversation, and this is where I can give a little bit more of a tangible answer, um, is I've got, a, I've got a call with a client at four o'clock this afternoon. And, and that conversation has come about because the, the relationship hold with that client, uh, there was a bad debt. Uh, the bad debt is not going to impact on the uh, on the on the ability for that company to to continue to to, to trade on. Um, but there are there are snippets of what we've discussed today in in, in Escalate and and creditor services that you know we can now make that client aware of. Uh, we can talk more widely about um, about what what they're seeing in the current market and how they're feeling and and, and what what plans can be made for the future and. and that call may last half an hour, it may last an hour, it may last, it may last 10 minutes if, they, if they, don't, they don't want to talk to, talk to me for any longer, but we won't charge for that call. Uh, and I don't want cost, we don't want cost to be a barrier to this. We are open to have conversations and it's really important that those on this call this morning uh, are aware of that. Um, so yeah, hopefully that covers that off. Okay, thank you, Jack. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Second question is, I own a business that has had a really, and this one's to you, Jack, as well, I think. I own a business that has had a really tough couple of years and cash is tight. The bank says it is supportive, but I'm not convinced. When should I be talking to specialists? And that is from uh, Anonymous. Yeah. Um, well, I hope, hopefully the tone of what I've said this morning has come across, and, and, and that's always um, and, and, and regular conversations it is very much, in my opinion, the, the remedy to, 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 to talking about any difficulties that may be on the horizon or that you are you are currently facing. Um, it's there are barriers. There are barriers we're all aware of. These when 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 situations arise that are causing challenges within your businesses. Who do I talk to? What is it actually appropriate to talk about? Uh, and, and ultimately, how much is that? How much is that going to cost? And I want to smash through those barriers. Um, we're we're here. We, we're open to talking, and 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 it doesn't. That there are no stupid questions. Um, so if that scenario, if that situation, uh, is is something you're currently facing, or is something that you're conscious or worried about happening uh, later down the line, um, then then that then now is the time. Now is the time to talk, and and it's always it's always a good time to talk. Okay. Thank thank you, Jack. Um, next question. Uh, again from anonymous and i think this one's for you malcolm is my company's balance sheet is, my company's balance sheet position is negative but we are trading profitably does this mean we are insolvent okay thanks charles um in the first instance yes uh, a, a, a negative balance sheet is one of the uh, tests for insolvency um but it's not the end of the story um, if the business is profitable and has a good chance of uh, trading, if you like, the balance sheet to a positive situation, um, then that's fine from the director's point of view, as long as they've minuted and documented their reasoning for continuing to trade, for instance. Um, but it may be that they need assistance in getting to that endpoint, and that's where, for instance, uh, a CVA um, might come in, um, where they can uh, just ring fence that debt on the balance sheet and work to uh, repay it over a period of time and return the balance sheet to uh, a positive place. Brilliant. Thank Thanks, Malcolm. Um, uh, sorry, I was just coming off mute because my dog had wandered into the room. Um, the next question uh, is for you, Luke. Um, I think there might be a couple here in a row. So, so what are the type of cases Escalate can pursue and what is the time frame for resolving a case? Okay, thank you, Charles. Um, it, it's pretty much anything, to be honest, from um, sort of the, lo the low value day-to-day um, -day book debt. So you, you issue an invoice and somebody's not paying your invoice uh, right the way through to a sort of multi uh, multi-million pound sort of complex legal dispute uh, it could be ip infringement it could be it could be employee related um it could be breach of contract it, it's pretty much anything i think the key things are that um that it that it's got merit um and that we can be confident that if we do pursue a case uh, the other side can um, can basically afford to pay the um the award so i think anything and we're always we're always open to um to looking at anything 
Um, in, in terms of time frame, it's it, it's kind of a case by case basis. Um, we, we, we kind of market escalate um, along the lines of we target a, a quick recovery, um, which is kind of within three months. But I think the reality of it is it, it will depend on the case. And we've done we've done some straightforward book debt collections for um, for clients and for other businesses where sort of ten thousand pounds, for example, um, has been recovered within a couple of days, whereas prior to that, the business has been sort of taking months to try and recover it. Um, we, we've had other cases where um, we've been pursuing um, parties and you've got to follow set protocol. And when you get into the you, you get into sort of issuing proceedings and you, you, you're going through the disclosure um, procedure, naturally these things do take longer to pursue. But I think that the, the key thing with Escalate is that because you've got the weight of Escalate behind you and you've, you've got a fully funded package, uh, we, we can be saying to the other side, look, Ultimately, there's no risk on our client's part. So whilst you might have every intention to sort of drag this out and you might have every intention to see us in court, actually, if, if you're not in a particularly strong position, it does make sense to try and do a deal. And that really is, is, is the kind of premise behind Escalate. It's about trying to negotiate. It's about avoiding um, legal action if possible, because ultimately, it costs money and it takes time and it's about trying to get some sort of quick resolution which suits suits you um and 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 the other parties so i think yeah it, it's a case-by-case -case basis but the onus is very much on on as a, a quicker resolution as possible okay great and, and just stick and you uh, i'll ask the question because it's in the box but, but you may have just uh, covered this i'm having problems collecting a retention on a construction contract can Bishop Fleming help? Yeah, ab absolutely, we can. Um, again, this this falls well. It, it potentially falls into the escalate territory. I, I mean, I think it depends on the is it a can't pay um, or is it a won't pay situation. So if if it's a case that we can we can use escalate on to help you recover it, uh, we've we've got uh, various construction specialists within the escalate network that can provide the input you you need on on sort of quantifying cases, all that sort of stuff. Um, if, if it's not one for Escalate, possibly because um, I don't know, may, maybe we're not overly comfortable about the about the sort of credit worthiness of, um, of the other side. It's one where we can also uh, coming back to the sort of credit of services thing that I mentioned, it's one where we can potentially engage with with the with the business that owes you money to help appraise them on their financial position, um, appraise them on their options in the interest of, of hopefully keeping them in business, but also maximizing the return to you. Because uh, like I said, the the goal for us here is to um, is, is to keep everybody in business. And actually that's normally the best outcome for you is to keep your keep your customer in business. So yes, it, it, it could be a it, it could be a bit of legal work that we can help with um, on the Escalate model, or it could actually be that you can just introduce us to your client so that we can have a chat with them um, and that we can help them, which is, is ultimately about helping you as well. OK, great. Um, I'm going to just pick, I don't know who I'm going to pick. I'm going to pick Jack for this one. Um, I've worked hard to get my company financially straight, but have been unable to clear a historic tax debt and I'm running out of time with HMRC. What can I do to save my business? Thank you, Charles. I'll unmute myself uh, this time. Um, yeah. It, at the risk of, of sounding repetitive, uh, the first step is, is, is let's have a conversation. Um, let's understand uh, the history of, of the relationship with HMRC, of um, what's going on within the business, what the horizon looks like. I mean, I think it's really underestimated at this moment in time um, just how impossible it is to, to make any predictions on financial performance. Um, and there really is no guessing as to where it goes next. Um, you know, it, I, I personally feel, yeah, optimistic about what, what may happen in, in the spring and, and what we may or may not be able to do, but it could equally go the, the other way. And uh, it's, 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 it's just important that we, we keep talking uh, and that we keep um, uh, sussing out and, and being able to react. Uh, you know, I think it, we are IPs, but there's no getting away from that. But the focus of these conversations, the objectives of these conversations is not right. Okay, which process we put you in. Uh, the genuine objective is very much to steer clear of those processes. And if we do need a process, then we go into it 
well organized, well planned, with clear objectives, with clear plans as, as to why that why that um you know why that process is is needed. Um, so without knowing the specifics of, of your story, which I'm very, very keen to hear. Uh, so let's have a conversation. Um, I, I can't answer that question specifically, but what I can tell you is is there's conversations to be had, there's options to explore, uh, and, and there's a solution that, that, that we can come to, uh, a controlled and sensible solution that we can come to together. Um, so hopefully that, that provides some clarity. Great, thanks Jack. Um, options and conversations uh, to explore. Um, a direct question to Malcolm from Ian Davey. How far do you travel to look at an insolvency problem? And also, what can you do about meetings given the current lockdown? OK, thanks, Charles. Um, in the first instance, we're happy to talk to anyone and everyone who has a particular uh, issue. Or, or question. Um, we can then determine uh, to what degree we need to follow that up with them. Uh, and in normal circumstances, there's nothing better than uh, visiting a company director at his own premises, at the business premises, uh, where you, you just get that sort of feel for what they're about and what their business is about. Um, whether that's in Devon, Northumberland, East Anglia, we'll, we'll, we'll go when circumstances permit, OK? Um, in the current circumstances, quite clearly, uh, we have to be careful uh, for uh, from our staff's point of view, from the client's point of view, um, and we can do remote sessions as, as we're uh, experiencing now, and we've all become experts in over the last 10 months or so. Um, we can have carefully controlled uh, visits by agents uh, who can then give us sort of uh, asset appraisals uh, and other useful information. And we can have, you know, as I say, um, COVID safe uh, meetings when those are appropriate. Um, but the message is we'll look at any opportunity uh, and we'll determine from there to what extent we then need to uh, have fiscal um, contact throughout the country. That's that's, that's fine. Um, we can travel. OK, great. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, there's a there's a few left to sort of run through in the time. Uh, Luke, we are seeing a number of high profile restructures at the moment. Debenhams, Topshop, etc. Do you think this will flow down into the SME market? Um, yeah, thank you, Charles. I think the answer is 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 probably yes. Um, now we we don't get involved in the the restructurings of the of the top shops of this world, but what what we tend to find is that there are various um, various businesses within the supply chain of these of these much larger companies that that inevitably will get impacted by um, by insolvencies. And again, it's it's about bad debts, and it's about being being on top of the problems as early as possible. So I think yes, a lot of these a lot of these problems do sort of filter down from London. Um, Timescales are always impossible to um, sort of determine, but if we see crashes in the economy, um, that will inevitably lead other businesses um, being exposed. It will cause them problems, um, and it, it, it therefore um, makes taking early advice uh, even more important. So yes, I think the answer is yes, it will. To what extent, it, it's sort of impossible to um, to tell, to be honest. Okay. Great, thanks, Luke. Um, here's a pretty specific one. I might stay with you, Luke, on this one. Uh, it's about a, a CVA, creditors voluntary arrangement. If a company with retail sites rents, if a company, sorry, if a company with retail sites rents has completed a CVA, can it return and renegotiate, say, six months afterwards with the landlords? Uh, yes, yes is the answer. Absolutely. Um, Contracts can always be re sort of renegotiated. Um, it, it, it's ultimately down to both parties. Uh, it will be the case that uh, liabilities, if if they exist, liabilities at a given point will fall into a CVA. Uh, but going forward, that doesn't stop a company from uh, from taking on new business, from from securing new contracts, and and most certainly from um, uh, sort of renegotiating existing contracts. 
Okay, great. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more question and I'm going to ask this one to Hazel. Um, are there any insurance policies that you think businesses should have and see them commonly not in place? We, we actually see it's quite common for people not to always have considered whether tax fee protection insurance would be worthwhile. So when HMRC carry out investigations, um, then the professional fees would be covered. So that could be whether that's VAT, pay as you earn or corporate tax. Um, so I recommend again looking to see whether you have adequate cover in the in the event of um, um, an HMRC inquiry. OK, great. And I think I'd, I'd add to that, um, you know, uh, credit, uh, credit insurance is, is a good is a good insurance um, that many businesses don't have and don't need it. And then the moment they get a bad debt, they wish they did have it, uh, notwithstanding escalate. So um, with just a couple of minutes left, um, it probably falls back to me to firstly say thank you to all our speakers um, for giving their time and their, and their advice this morning. It's I've been sort of trying to summarise some points. I've got sort of scribblings around Jack's safety car analogy um, and, and sort of that link around developing um, uh, business resilience and recognising that whilst that safety car is out there, all might be OK, but it's going to come in. And I think that is really relevant to, to 2021 and beyond. That support has to come to an end and businesses that, that are you know, trading well or, or trading well with that support just need to take time to make sure that when, when it is gone or when the C-bills loans need to start being repaid, that the cash flow is there and that uh, the business is able to trade on and keep going uh, and investing and, and trading well. Um, Luke, Luke has obviously explained about our Escalate service, which is a massive uh, opportunity for, for many businesses to just get certain debtors who either can't pay or won't pay to to try and recover some cash with all that cash locked up in in the debtor services. And I think as a final thought before I close, as as all the speakers have said and Malcolm has sort of drawn out in, in his uh, answers and conversation is just talk early that there's no charge to talking to the restructuring team or talking to any of us around I've, you know, these types of conversations. We're here to help you and to help businesses survive and thrive. We're not here for doing anything else. So please, please speak to us early. And uh, that falls to me to say thank you very much for attending this morning. We will put a, I think we'll publish this sometime later this week on our restructuring knowledge hub on our website. And if we've missed any questions, we'll be sure to get back to you. Thank you very much.